Okay, <laughs> hi everyone. Uh, it's been an interesting time dealing with technical difficulties, so thanks for your grace and your patience. Thank you, Esau, for your grace and patience as we deal with this. Um, yeah, welcome to the Biblical Studies Forum. Um, <laughs> so, oh, my bad. Uh, I'm Allison, by the way. I'm part of the Biblical Studies Committee. We try to put on one to two forums a year. Uh, because of COVID, we haven't been able to do that. So now we're going online. Uh, and today we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Isa McCauley, who wrote Reading Well Black, which is a huge privilege. And yeah, we're all really excited to hear from him. Uh, because we've lost a lot of time, I'm just going to really briefly explain what the event is going to look like. So um, we'll have about 45 minutes of Esau presenting. Uh, Jesse's going to introduce him. Uh, and then after he's presented, we'll have a Q&A period. You guys can enter your questions in the Q&A box that is just at the top of your screen. Um, and then we'll curate some questions that you guys can um, give to us. And we can't get to all questions just because of time, but we will uh, pick ones we find most relevant. So um, that's how the event is going to work. I'm going to pass it on to Jesse, who will introduce Esau. All right. Thanks, everybody, for your patience with us uh, once again. Um, my name is Jesse Nickel. Uh, I teach biblical studies here at CBC, um, and I'm very excited to join Allison in welcome you, uh, welcoming you all here to this uh, community forum, um, which we've been looking forward to for quite some time. I, I feel like I need to add my apology as well for all of the technical difficulties. We thought we had this all sorted out, and then we had about three or four things go wrong all at once. So. Uh, Isa has been very patient with us and on the phone with us, uh, and he's here and ready to go. I had this whole intro ready to go, but I think in the interest of time, it's not me or Allison you're here to listen to, uh, it's Isa. So uh, very briefly, just to introduce our speaker to you all, um, Dr. Isa McCauley is uh, the Assistant Professor of New Testament at Wheaton College, uh, located just outside of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, Isa also serves as the canon theologian for his diocese in the Anglican Church in North America. Uh, Isa is the author of two books, uh, first Sharing in the Son's Inheritance, uh, which was a revision of his doctoral thesis that he completed at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, and then, of course, also, as Allison mentioned already, and more recently, Reading While Black, uh, African-American Biblical Interpretation as an Exercise in Hope which, of course, will be forming the background for his presentation to us today. Uh, Esau is married to Mandy, and together they have four great children. Um, and I had uh, some really great questions, Esau, to get to know you a little bit here, uh, beyond just what a bio can do. Um, but I think, like I mentioned, in the interest of time, I'll probably just turn it over to you as quickly uh, as we can. Um, uh, thanking you one more time for your patience and for your willingness to be here with us. We are really looking forward to what you've got to share. So Esau, the floor is yours. The, fu the funny thing about all of this is that when I met Jesse, um, he talks to me about how Canadians have one pr a problem of over apologizing. <laughs> so it's just funny to me that like I, I finally get a chance to speak to some of my Canadian brothers and sisters and I met with a barrage of apologies. And we're not even sure whose fault the technology is. It could be mine. It could be what happened when, uh, you know, the United States internet clashes with the Canadian internet. So I'm glad for all of you who stuck around. And I'm thankful for Jesse for inviting me. He was a good friend to me when I was at the University of St. Andrews. So I value his friendship and you all are blessed to have him. If you're, if his dean or president is here, keep Jesse. He is a gem. Well, now he didn't pay me to say that part. I just said that of my own volition. What I'm gonna do now is share my screen if that works well. And if it doesn't, then Jesse, can you at least unmute yourself? and tell me that it's not working. Is it is it visible? So since Jesse's not talking, I'm going to say that, that means that it is visible. Did they all did you all can see this? Cuz someone Jesse, are you nodding at me to say I can see it? Okay, we're good. So this this means yes, you can see it. Okay. 
So the talk, the topic of my talk is tired feet, rest, rested souls, um, resources for the political witness of the church. And I wanted you all to see if this is where if this where this came from. There's a woman named Mother Pollard, and she participated in the Montgomery bus boycott. And for those of you who don't know the American context, one of these seminal moments in the history of the civil rights movement, which led to the expanded freedoms uh, for African Americans in particular, there was an African American woman who, rather than riding the bus and accept segregated segregated seating, she um, walked to and from work as a maid every day. And so one of the newspapers interviewed her, and they said, "How does it feel having to walk instead of having the opportunity to ride the bus, even though you you know because of segregation?" And so she responds with this phrase to become seminal. Um, kind of in the black church context, which is broken English, but she captured the heart of it well, which is my feet is tired, but my soul is rested. And and so I use that as this, as this idea of, of what it meant for an African-American to fight for justice in their context. But yes, it, it, it bore something, the marks of this stuff on our bodies, but the soul peace, the peace that we have from God um, is immeasurable. The other thing that I wanted to juxtapose with that is Paul's um, passage in Galatians, where Paul is trying to convince the Galatians to, to be the Christians he had called them to be. And Paul asked this, this, this really piercing question where he asked, have I now become your enemy for telling you the truth? And I've thought about this a lot because when African-American, at least in the United States, African-American Christians had began to talk about social justice and issues related to the political witness of the church, we've often been met with recrimination. And so the question that, 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 that I always say to people is whenever I get lectures like this, people always push back on one idea or the other. And I say, listen, I'm just doing the best that I can as a Christian to articulate what I think might be the Christian witness in the world. And so what I'm going to do with the time that we have today is hopefully become your enemy or even become your friend for telling you the truth. So this is a picture of Rosa Parks after she was arrested during the same Montgomery bus boycott. And what I'm going to read to you first is a quote from a letter that was written by seven African-American, actually seven white clergy. And it says the following, and, th and these are the, this was a letter that was written um, from white clergy to Martin Luther King and the other people who participated in the civil rights movement. And he said the following, every human being is created in the image of God and is entitled to respect as a fellow human being with all basic rights, privileges, and responsibilities which belong to humanity. So on the face of it, this is great. These seven white clergy are saying, yes, all human beings, we're all image bearers. We all de deserve respect and well, um, good treatment. But then they followed up with another line responding to the civil rights protests that were going on in Alabama at the time. By the way, for those of you who don't know, I'm from like right down the road from all, where these things happen. So this is for me, local history, even though it becomes a national story. So they go on to criticize the civil rights movement and they say the following, such actions as to incite hatred and violence, however technically peaceful those actions may be, have not contributed to the resolution of our local problems. We do not believe that these days of new hope are days when extreme measures are justified in Birmingham. And so what these people are saying is like, look, 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 these, we, rec we recognize that African-Americans have rights, but we think that these, these nonviolent protests and marches aren't actually um, leading to the progress or the furthering of the public good, that, that the, Christ the black Christians who are engaging in political protests are being too radical. And so what now becomes known as one of the more famous speeches in at least North, I should say North America, in the United States history is a letter from a Birmingham jail in which Martin Luther King is actually responding to these letters. So what is known as the letter from a Birmingham jail is actually the response to the criticism that we just read, where there were white clergy who were saying, yes, you, you, African-Americans deserve rights, but your protests now are too radical. And here is um, King's response. 
He says in, in, in a much wider letter, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the eighth century left their villages and carried their, thus saith the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their own hometowns. And just as the apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world. So I too feel compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my hometown. Like Paul, I must answer the Macedonian call for aid. So in other words, what King is arguing is that just as the prophets and Jesus went from where they were to other places to preach the message that God had given them to preach, King said, it is okay for me to preach the message that God has given to me. And so King though, King, when he says this, he taps into a large tradition of African-American Christian political witness. So in other words, this idea that there are Oh, people are unable to see my slides. Hold on for a second. I asked Jesse to tell me that from the beginning and I will click on it again and see if that now can they see it? Now we can see it. We we could see them and then they disappeared for some reason. Okay. But we can They're see back. them again. Yeah. There we go. They're back? They're back. If they disappear, we'll just let me know and then I'll just take it down and you all can just have to see some of this stuff without it. But this is I think at least is important. So the, in the in the tradition in the black tradition of Christian political witness, there is not just King, but there's also people like Frederick Douglass. And one of the one one of these seminal moments of Christian political witness that Jesse, not Jesse, Jesse didn't do this, Frederick Douglass did it, is on the fourth of July. And he wrote probably his most famous speech ever, which is this question. What to the slave is the 4th of July? And what I want you all to attend to, if you can see, we'll skip the first part and we'll go down to what he says at the bottom. Speaking of the celebration around American independence, he says your prayers, your hymns, your sermons, your thanksgivings, with all the religious parade and solemnity are to him, he means to God, the bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A, then veil to cover up crimes that would disgrace a nation of savages. It feels bad to speak so bad about the United States in front, in front of the Canadians. You guys probably like this part. But <laughs> what he's getting at, though, is that this American claim to greatness makes no sense in the context of a place that enslaves people. And the part that I want you to pay attention to here is that he came to the religious claims that the United States is making. So he, so he, he leverages, Douglas leverages, this, this this American tradition of celebrating the 4th of July to point out our religious hypocrisy. So King, Douglas, and if we had time, we'd go through a long list of African-Americans who've done this. And so now we're at the question. But the question is this, are King and Douglas correct in the sense that part of the Christian witness before the watching world is to ask the question, of whether or not the gospel has anything to say about how we order our society. So in the time that I have, I'm gonna do three movements. I probably, actually four, I won't do all of them. Definitely not five because we've lost some time. What I wanted to do was just turn to 1 Timothy chapter two to call to pray for all people. So I'll probably have enough time to do a little bit about Jesus and Herod, and maybe we'll skip forward to John in the book of, um, in his revelations. And then, if we got time, we'll come back with Jesus. So we're going to look at these passages and see what they have to tell us in particular about the political witness of the church. So what is this first Timothy passage? I cannot speak to what's going on in a Canadian context, but in North America, when, when Christians began to think about political theology, this is one of the first things that they often present. This idea that Paul says that it is the job of Christians to pray for all those who are in authority. Now, there's nothing wrong with this idea of praying for the people in authority. As a Christian, who doesn't think that prayer is good? But prayer, actually, this call to prayer for um, our leaders is often tied to a couple of other ideas that exist below the surface and are always articulated. And one of them is this the luxury of time. When I talk about the luxury of time, it's this idea that, well, 
if we pray for our leaders, because our leaders are basically good, eventually we will opt, we will opt for the good, the true, and the beautiful. But one of the things that African Americans have historically said is, while we're waiting on the luxury of time that exists for the privilege, it is actually us who suffer. The other thing that often undergirds this idea in a democratic republic to pray for our leaders is this confidence in our leaders' wisdom. In other words, this is the idea that, of course, if you give us time, because we're basically good people, we're going to do the right thing. But any recourse to history shows that, at least in an African-American context, freedom has never simply been granted. It's always been something that we've had to fight for tooth and claw. Another um, major flaw in this idea that First Timothy is the place where we begin to think about um, a political theology is the idea that it doesn't even take Timothy as a whole seriously. Because what, when we tend to say we should pray for our leaders, attached to the idea that we should pray for our leaders is often this idea that we shouldn't be criticizing our leaders. So in other words, prayer replaces criticism. So we should pray, we should not get involved in policy or political debates. But if you just kind of flip back in your Bibles to chapter one in the same book, we have Paul saying the following. And this is Paul talking about what it means to live as a Christian in his day. And he says, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and for rebels and for slave traders and for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Why do I point that passage out in the context of prayer for our leaders? Well, I think it's I think it's well known that slavery in the Greco-Roman world was legal. And then it was a it was something that was a, a means of making money in the first century. But Paul calls slave trading a heresy, something that's contrary to sound Christian doctrine. And so in the same letter in which Paul is calling for us to pray for our leaders, Paul is also critiquing an established practice of Rome. So that means in the same letter where there's the discussion of prayer, it's also a critique for Roman practices. So prayer for leaders does not necessarily rule out criticism of those same leaders. And we have to begin to ask ourselves, why is it that we begin, at least in America, in a United States context, of thinking about political witness by leading with prayer without looking at some of the other politically edgy passages in the New Testament. And we're going to turn one of those next. Now, here is a brief interaction, and I hate to do this. I don't know if you're allowed to do this in in Canada, because forgive me, this is my first time speaking to Canadians. I'm so excited about this. <laughs> um, but in the United States, they call this like pulling the Jesus card. And I'm pulling the Jesus card really early. So Jesus did it, we can do it. So this is the interaction with Jesus and the Pharisees in Luke chapter 13. And in context, Luke is saying to Jesus, hey, Herod wants to kill you. You should get out of here. And I'm going to read what happens next. So Pharisees who don't really care about Jesus, they just want to get rid of him. He replies, this is Jesus replying to the Pharisees. Go tell that fox, I'll keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I'll reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Now, what does it mean for Jesus to call Herod a fox? First question, like why then is Jesus even a threat to Herod? But we'll leave this part alone because we'll talk about what a fox was because we're running out of time. A fox in the first century was someone who was conniving and deceitful. So in other words, when you call someone like sly like a fox, in our day, that actually comes from this biblical idea that a, a fox is conniving and deceitful. Now, why is this important? Because this is not a statement about Herod's piety, right? He's not saying that Herod is a bad Jew, right? Because he doesn't, you know, keep Sabbath. He is saying that Herod's power, Herod's political power, is maintained through deception and compromise. That Herod doesn't actually have the support of the people, but Herod is someone who uses manipulation to get what he wants. So in other words, Jesus is saying that Herod was willing to allow his people to suffer so that he might stay in power. So what you then have um, here as it relates to Jesus, inherit the fox, 
is Jesus's comment on Herod's politics that influenced the lives of people. So if, if, if Jesus can then take a step back and look at Herod and say, Herod, you are a corrupt ruler who doesn't truly care about the people, then it is simply false to say that part of being a Christian means separating yourself from political analysis because Jesus does the same thing. Now, if it's okay, if I can move on and say a little bit more about this, let's conclude with what Jesus says about himself and how that relates to, to the political witness of the church. Jesus concludes this discussion of Herod with saying the following, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. So when Jesus says this, Jesus is tying himself to the prophetic witness of Christians, not of Christians, of Jews who have functioned as God's prophet in the Old Testament. And this raises the question, what did the prophets who were often persecuted actually say? So Jesus says, I must continue my work because no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. The question then becomes, well, then what do these prophets do and what did these prophets say to get them in trouble? Now, if you look at the prophetic witness, and this is an oversimplification, we're just going to look at Isaiah. You see Isaiah doing things like protesting social injustice. You see here in Isaiah 5, 8, where he says, Woe to you who add house to house and field to field, so there is no space left alone for you, and you live alone in the land. In other words, Isaiah is saying, listen, rich people, you're buying up all of the property so that the people can't afford to live, and now the, the poor are left homeless. You also see um, uh, Isaiah speaking about the first, the abandoning the one true God. So in, instead of um, worshiping the one true God, the people of Israel had turned their backs on them. You see also here in Isaiah, him saying very clearly, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. So what you see there, at least in the prophetic testimony of Isaiah, who's cited throughout Jesus's ministry, is yes, a call to faithfulness to the one God of Israel, but also at the exact same time, a protest of injustice. And so Jesus then is saying that I'm a part of this long tradition of prophets who are killed outside of Jerusalem, then it means that Jesus is a part of a group of people who are, who are killed precisely because they advocated for faithfulness to the one God of Israel and for justice. Now we move on to our beloved Apostle Paul. And I wish I had time to give you a whole bucket of Pauline political theology, but I am going to limit, my, limit myself to one little section. And this is here in Galatians chapter one, verses three to five. Jesse, can they still see me? You can at least nod. They can, okay, so they're still working. So I don't need to see your face for you to nod, Jesse. You can just move your head. That's okay. <laughs> so this is Galatians chapter three, chapter one, verses three to five. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Now, why do I think that this verse here that seems to be Paul's declaration of salvation have anything to do with the Christian political theology? Now, Paul is more than capable of saying that Jesus died for our sins so that we might be justified or reconciled to God. He has all kinds of ways of talking about the fruit of the cross. But what he says here is, I think, very interesting for thinking about how a Christian might think about their witness in the world. Paul refers to the, 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 his moment as the present evil age. And what I would ask people to think about is that this very simple question, what is included under the banner of present evil age? Would it include the social world of the Greco-Roman Empire, the politics of the Greco-Roman Empire, the economy of the Greco-Roman Empire? Of course it does. So when Paul calls the social world in which the Christians lived and moved and breathed evil, he was not simply making a detached spiritual analysis. He was looking at the world around it and calling it wicked. Why is that important? We see this all of the time. Luckily, you all have much more reasonable um, 
gun laws. Can I talk about this in American politics? So, <laughs> so when we have like um, these these this endless barrage of mass shootings here in the United States, we look at this event and we say that event is evil. That is a theological analysis of what's going on in society. So when Paul says that the present evil age or the present age in which he lived and moved and breathed is evil, it is Paul looking at the system that, of the world in which he functions and calling it fundamentally broken. And so for me, as an African-American Christian who is contending for justice in society, and I call the things that are happening to black people evil, this is not simply a political analysis. It is a theological assessment of the state of society that is in keeping with what Paul had to say about the record of the world in which he lived and moved. So with that, I know we've gone Jesus really quickly. We've gone Paul. I'm trying to keep the um, um, world, I'm, sorry, I'm trying to keep this canonical and not take too much time. I think I want to leave some time for Q&A. So I'm going to end with, um, what John has to say about the church in, and uh, not the church, what, what John has to say about um, Rome in the book of Revelation. As a side note, someone's going to have to explain to me, and maybe we can get some of the people in biblical studies here at, um, at, at CBC, is to explain to me why we didn't start our political theology with the book that has the most political theology in the New Testament, namely the book of Revelation. We should have started here in Christian theology more broadly, but we'll leave that for another day. This is uh, what John has to say about what is going on in um, Rome. And he talks about what's going to happen when there's judgment. And he goes, the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys her cargo anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, all of these things. And then he goes, including human beings sold as slaves. So in other words, one of the reasons that the world is going to weep over the fall of Rome is because Rome was materialism. They kept the world fat on corrupt goods has now been taken away. And one of those goods that they're being judged for selling unjustly are human beings sold as slaves. Why this was never added into a real assessment of political theology, I don't know. But even more important than that one is the idea that John calls Rome Babylon. Why is that so important? And this is why it's important. In calling Rome Babylon, what John was doing was saying Rome was a type of something that recurs in history. There's the first Babylonian empire. And why was the first Babylonian empire judged? In part, if you, according to Daniel chapter four, is that it was judged for its injustice and its mistreatment of people. And so when, when John calls Rome Babylon, he is saying that Rome exists as the manifestation of a type. That means there's these periodically these empires that arise that exploit people. And Rome as an exploitative slave trading empire is a manifestation of a biblical form that is often subject to God's judgment. So what is what is what is what does um, John do here then? John says, as I look upon the society in which I live, I see a people who are subjected to God's judgment because they resemble a f another nation that was subjected to God's judgment. So what happens when we put these three things together? I know we can, I may do more in the Q&A if people have some questions, but I just want to spend a moment here and I just want to say, what happens when you bring these three things together? I began by looking at this, at, at Martin Luther King and Frederick Douglass in particular. And these two scholars are, are not, these two theologians were people who saw in the gospel this call for an engagement and transformation of society. And I began to ask the question of, is there, are there examples in the New Testament itself of people making political assessments of the world in which they lived? And I showed you that Jesus himself makes a political assessment of the world in which he lives. He calls Herod a corrupt ruler. If you then say, well, then that's just one part of the canon. I say, well, let's look at another key highway through which we can look at the New Testament, and that's in that's in Paul's letters. And if we had time, and you want to ask me about for more more examples in Paul, I would say here, here's Paul looking at the society around him and calling it calling it evil to 
um, Christians in his day. That's okay, then, then the other third major kind of footprint in the New Testament, I would say, would be the Johannine, Johannine literature. And if you look in the Johannine literature, you see, once again, this depiction of Rome as Babylon is a man is calling the empire of his day the manifestation of a type. And so it is simply the case that if we're going to take the New Testament seriously, Christians have always had more to say about the world than trust in Jesus. And one day you'll go and be with him in glory, as important as all of that is. It is also there's a long legacy of Christians who have seen the world as fundamentally broken and called evil by its name. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isa. That was uh, an impressive amount of ground to cover here. And uh, that's great. That's fantastic because there's such richness to all this stuff that you're talking about. Um, so, uh, so everybody is aware of how this is going to work. I'm not sure, uh, just to make clear, since we started off with a little bit of stumbling here uh, at the beginning. Um, can everybody hear me to make sure? Isa, you can hear me. Everybody can hear me. It's all good. OK, good. So um, if you if anybody who's listening, if you would be interested in submitting some questions for um, Dr. McCauley to respond to, you may do so um, uh, through teams here. So just feel free to type those in and those will be monitored uh, and sent in the direction of myself and Allison and, and we'll bring them up as we go along. Um, I'm going to get the conversation started a little bit here. So um, I'm interested, Isa, so you make this pretty, I mean, exciting, frankly, case of how these various parts of the New Testament articulate, uh, first of all, a critique of the world around them and the, the, you know, the political situation. And you even pointed like with the references to Isaiah and certainly other places in uh, Revelation, et cetera, there's the description of an alternative, right? So then the question is, is that all there is? Is it just talking about this vision? Is it just talking a whole lot and saying, yeah, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. And here is what we're headed toward, what's really good. Or how do we meet those? Like, what's our job in actually meeting those two, right? And how do we actually take action in this? I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad you asked that question. It depends on what your job is. So what I mean is, let's talk about like the the church as a institution and then the church as the body of Christ. Well, that may seem like a strange distinction, but if you give me a second, it'll make sense. I'm a New Testament scholar. Jesse, you're a New Testament scholar. We're not pundits, right? And so I have no idea. I have no idea what the like what the political situation is in Canada, but in America, we're always mad about something every week. And one week it's gun control, the next week it's immigrants at the border, the next week it's, you know, um, like, elect, like, so it can feel um, in the United States like there's a controversy every week. And so it's hard for a Bible scholar to know, like, a, a policy position on every single issue. That feels like, like I, I, I wasn't even thinking about this two weeks ago. Now I got to figure out prison reform. So I think it is really hard for the church or the, maybe, maybe an individual pastor or an individual theologian, unless your world is politics, to at every moment have a policy plan for every sin or every part that's broken. And but what but but what I do want to wait. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Am, am, <laughs> that was confusing. OK, sorry. Um, <laughs> so what I was going to say, it's really hard for someone to have a policy, a policy point for everything. But I do think it's possible to be competent to recognize injustice when you see it. And so part of the, the gift of the church is to use the power of its voice to sometimes point the direction in the conversation. And sometimes as a pastor or as a, a scholar, that's the limit of what I can do. I'm not stupid. I can't tell you the policy, but I know you shouldn't put kids in cages. I can do that part, right? But now you take a step back and you say, not church is institution, church is body of Christ, in which you then have a bunch of different people who are Christians who are engaging in the public square. So then you actually have Christians who are politicians, Christians who are economists, Christians who are immigrants, immigrant activists, and it becomes their job 
to begin to direct the wider body in the right direction. So one of the things that tends to happen is that like people think that one person can be omnicompetent. So I can't tell you how to fix the immigration crisis, at least in the United States. I can say, as a Christian, I see this as a real crisis, and now we need the experts who are gifted in different areas to direct us. It could even be the case that we would say to governmental leaders, okay, at least this works in America. I can't speak to, you know, I don't know what you all do in Canada. But we'll say, okay, give me three laws. Come to us with three different proposals about how we can fix this problem, and we can begin to discuss this and then talk to our senators and our representatives. And so these are the ways in which we begin to do those things. So I think that like that we can get into this place of making the church be competent in things beyond its abilities but i don't think that the church is we're not dumb we know we know wickedness when we see it so in some sense the church as institution now some places the policy is just it's just clearly bad we could say stop this but i just don't know how often a pastor or a theologian can say I know what the minimum wage should be, you know? And so I think that it is true that when it comes to like discrete policies, it's actually where Christians of goodwill can disagree. But the problem is, at least in America, sometimes we get, we have trouble getting people to agree that, you know, that the thing that we, th we should all know is bad, is bad. <laughs> so maybe my bar is really low. <laughs> and America was like, can we all agree that we at least need to fix this and then figure out what policy is the best way to do it. Thank you. That's yeah, that's helpful for thinking about something. I mean, it's just it's recognizing the fact that there is not there, there's not like a just obviously a simple one size fits all answer to all of it. Maybe I can ask you I mean, on in Canada. I'm asking you quick. What are y'all arguing about in Canada? Like we have like a thousand fights here in America. Maybe you should tell me. I mean, we can say this. Isa, you and I can have a conversation at another time here. Uh, uh, so I, I, there's a couple of follow-up questions here that have come in that, are, that are, are, are interesting to pick up on that, and in particular talking about how to negotiate this in a, in a different political context. I wanted to ask one, one quick follow-up, though, just uh, while, while I, I have the opportunity. I know, because uh, I, I know this, much of what you've spoken about today is, is part of what you've written in your book, and I saw that little on your slide that you were heading towards something that you discuss in this chapter later on is the Beatitudes, right? And I, I hope you're remembering here that you're not just talking to Canadians, right? You're talking to Mennonite Canadians. And oh, so, uh, you know, I was really just waiting for you because you have some pretty um, interesting and... Uh, compelling stuff to say about uh, peacemakers and about this language of peace in this whole vision. So I was wondering maybe if you could bring that into it a little bit for us. I was us. hoping somebody would ask me to give you the peacemaking stuff. So what I tried to argue, because, um, you know, once again, who doesn't want to conclude with Jesus, but I want to give enough time to give people a chance to ask me questions. And we, by the way, if you if the people aren't having to run off, I'll give you the extra 15 minutes. So don't worry about it that we started off late. Okay, and so, um, Isa, we got till five, just so you know. We have till five o'clock. I have no idea what time it is there, but that's okay. Oh, okay, um, we got half an hour still. Okay. We got time. Okay. So, um, what I said as it relates to peacemaking, I said two things. I Actually, I brought two Beatitudes towards the conclusion. And the first one is, and I'll get the Mennonite bit in a minute. Don't worry about Mennonite brothers and sisters. Um, it was, blessed are those who mourn. And when I talked about mourning, I talked about like the privilege of apathy and this idea that the world is broken and we should just accept it for how it is. And we just kind of basically build a wall or a world in which we're safe and we shut ourselves off from the sufferings of the world. And so when Jesus calls us to mourn, I think he's calling us to still see the sinfulness and the brokenness of the world for what it is. So to mourn for something is to still care about what is happening to other people. And so part of what it means to, to, to develop a political theology as a Christian is to still see the world as broken and allow that to break your heart. Because once you're hardening your heart to the suffering and you kind of go, it'll always be messed up, then that allows for injustice to continue. The second beatitude that I thought that was important was blessed are the peacemakers. And one of the things that like happens in America, when we start talking about peacemaking, 
we say, well, we you just kind of you, you criticize the, the 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 extremes of both sides. Anything the truth is always in the middle. And the analogy I like to use is when my when I have like four kids, and if one kid punches the other kid and the other kid kicks the other kid, now both of them are guilty, right? But the kid who threw the first punch, I got to make an assessment. You threw the punch, you started it, you deserve a little bit more punishment than the other kid. Now that means that any time that you are negotiating for peace, you're bringing like a resolution, it requires some kind of assessment, right? So peacemaking can't be separated from truth telling. It's not simply when you see two um, people in an argument that, that peacemaking means you all stop fighting. No, no, no. Christian peacemaking is inseparable from the telling of the truth. And that means in an American context, I gotta tell the truth about racism. And I'm not making Christian peace if I lie about what's happening to black people so they can be this false cessation of hostilities. The other thing that I think that, that, that I at least think is important about peacemaking, and this is at least me responding to a whole genre of scholarship that said that the peacemaking was only interpersonal. So this didn't, I didn't get into this too much in the book, but most people say this is about interpersonal peace, you know, not, you know, nation peace, like nation state peace. That's what, hold on. This is Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And there's a whole tradition in the, the messianic literature in places like Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 11 that part of the, of the Messiah's coming would be the cessation, the cessation of hostilities. So when you have the when you have the Messiah, the promised Messiah, speaking about his followers being peacemakers, that is a part of the inauguration of the kingdom. And what I mean by that, or what I meant by that when I said it, is the following. God, Jesus doesn't tell the people to like make them Christians and by making them Christians, then they will stop fighting. He actually says make peace. So he actually put the peacemaking as a pre-evangelistic act. So then you begin to ask yourself, well, then why are these Christians in the middle of the messy brokenness of the world advocating for peace, both between individuals and between nation states and, and ethnicities who are, host, who are at enmity with one another. And they're doing so because that is the kind of kingdom that the Messiah represents. So peacemaking then, when it's linked to truth telling, is a part of the evangelistic witness of the church because it embodies the kind of kingdom that God wants to bring about. And so you don't have to say that the only path to peace is if I convert everyone. You're saying that in the act of engaging in nonviolent like, peacemaking, you're doing a profoundly Christian activity. And so what I was trying to argue then is that it is simply part of the Christian vocation to jump into the mess, make an assessment of claims, and point towards the cessation of hostilities as a manifestation of God's coming kingdom, because the messianic age is one in which there will be peace. But that doesn't separate at all the Christian doing this on a very local level, that as the peacemaker in your family, you're doing God's own good work. So did that make me a good Mennonite? Did I, do I, can I, what do I get? Um, hi. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to bring up a question doctor, from Doctor. What uh, Doctor? What is your name? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I wish. Are you kidding me? I'm an undergrad student. <laughs> um, <laughs> wonderful undergrad student. <laughs> Sorry. What is your name? Oh, I'm Allison. Yeah. Hello, Allison. Sorry, I just forgot. It's been a lot. You should just. I'm not very easy to manage, so you just got to <laughs> come with me. This, this yeah. has been American. Sorry, forgive me. Okay, yeah, Allison, no what you ask me? Yeah, um, so I guess this uh, relates to what you were just talking about in terms of peacemaking, and so to speak a little bit about the Canadian, I guess for us it's Canadian Mennonite context, um, I think we find it quite easy, at least I found it quite easy to grasp um, your theology in the book. Um, I wasn't, I found that like what you were saying, I was like, yeah, I've heard that in my classes or like that, those are the conclusions I'm reaching as well, which is really encouraging and also really hopeful. 
So I think the questions that we're asking in our context are a lot more about application. Okay, like what do we do now because of this? Yeah. So um, a question that someone asks here is, how do you understand liberation theology in relation to a pacifist or nonviolent theology around liberation? So for Mennonites, we're pretty um, <laughs> passionate yeah. about nonviolent peacemaking. And how do you reconcile that with like the violent downfall of Babylon and Revelation? Yeah, so um, let me answer the first one. I am not, so liberation theology is not one thing. One of the things you should understand is that the, the um, Oh, I'll do this briefly. Liberation theology in its black form came as a result of the black power movement. So the civil rights movement initially began, I mean, has lots of beginning, but at the forefront of the civil rights movement was Martin Luther King, who is nonviolent resistance. And he's met with, you know, the things that you all, I think, I think have heard about. And in response to um, Martin Luther King's nonviolent resistance, you have the, you have the rise of black power. So liberation theology is an attempt to bring black power and and articulated Christian theology of kind of what be, what was a secular idea, this idea of um, kind of a violent means of bringing about liberation. This idea of violent revolution was was rejected by Dr. King and the majority of the black church. So what becomes the academic form of black theology, which is liberation theology, in as much as it is violent, I need to make sure that I like get that part down, does not, is not the, the predominant response of the civil rights movement. And so what you have then is a, a dialogue within the black community about the proper means and ends of liberation. And I am from the tradition of people who who stuck with King's nonviolent resistance. And so I don't reconcile those things. So in the sense that we just disagree. Um, now, the, 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 the tricky part about that is that that doesn't mean that I disagree with everything the liberation theology says. And there's points of contact about this, this idea that God is a God of freedom. Those kinds of things, they're points of connections. But when it gets to the to the means, this is this is this is the, the, the debate that happened in the black church between violent versus nonviolent social change. Now, as we relate to the question of Babylon, isn't that tricky? I mean, like this is not a question of Babylon, this is Christian eschatology. And how do we reconcile the idea that Jesus dies on the cross for the sin to the world and that Jesus, um, his fundamental way of being is one of, of, of forgiveness and love with the idea of God's judgment. And historically, the way that people have done that is to say that we consider God's judgment, his eschatological writing of wrongs, that eventually the things that have been done against the oppressed actually matter. And there is one person who we presume to be competent enough to make such judgments, and that's God himself. And so I don't think that anybody, and I talk about this in one of my chapters, nobody should be comfortable with Christian eschatology. If you're rejoicing in this idea of judgment, then you might, you know, you might need to see somebody and talk about it. Um, and so I am not someone who goes, yes, one day, like my, and I'll, I like to tell this story about um, this slave, and I, forget, I think it's Pennington, I forget his name. I've read too many of these stories, they're all running together in my head. But he escapes to the north and he kind of he's free. And years later, towards the end of his former master's life, he writes his former master and he says to him, hey, former master, dude, you're old. You're going to die soon. You should repent of your and the master was a Christian. But he says, like, look, the fact that you enslaved me and enslaved all of these other people was a sin and you're subject to God's judgment. So what you need to do, because you're old, is repent. And I began to think, what kind of convert, like, what kind of piety does it take for someone to write their former slave master on his deathbed and say, there's still time for you to become a different kind of person? That is because this man, his eschatology has bred compassion. He said, I don't want anybody to come before the living God having to answer for being a slave master. And so I don't think that like Christian eschatology and the eventual judgment of God's of wicked nations is something that fills me with pleasure. I think that the even for me, the best way of making sense 
of the dramatic imagery of the Old and New Testament is trying to get these nations to repent. Like this is the future that awaits you. This is not good. You should stop. So at least that's how I think about um, both liberation theology and um, um, how to make sense of the book of Revelation. You did good, Allison. We're good. Go ahead. <laughs> cool. yeah. um, sorry about that. Um, yeah, that was a good answer. Thank you. I think it leads into a lot of the other ones that people are asking here. So I'm just going to follow up with another one that somebody had asked. Um, so this person asks, what does it tangibly look like for the North American church to remove itself from the empire when it's so en enmeshed already? So I guess the assumption then that is that the North American government is Babylon. And then the other assumption would be like, how do we kind of separate ourselves from it? Yeah. I didn't call the North American church Babylon. That's the theological. I'm, I don't live in Canada, so I can't call Canada Babylon. So I don't, I don't want the Canadians coming for me. So <laughs> what I would say is, and this, and this is the tricky part, and this is the tricky part. We are immersed in something that is broken. And this is the hard part because the brokenness, like this is what I talk about mourning and it can lead you to being apathetic. So the hard part is to constantly be aware of all of the ways which we're compromised and begin to fight against them in the best ways that we know how. So I can talk about um, my context as a New Testament scholar and the things that they say that I should do in order to be successful. I just ignore most of those things, Allison, because those things are designed to perpetuate certain kinds of systems. And so what you have to do is figure out what rebellion looks like. You want to say, well, what, is that, what does that mean in my context? Well, like this is a super male, masculine, like big, tough energy discipline. And so well, what are the ways in which I can resist this kind of systemic exclusion of women in biblical studies. Well, I can find as many smart students as I can, female students say, do you want to be underpaid for the rest of your life like everyone else? Come join biblical <laughs> studies. When I am looking for um, book projects, I can be intentional about who I invite to um to participate when there is the when there are the meetings of the various societies and no one wants to talk to the three women in the room because I don't know they're crazy people I go and start a conversation with them and so that that may these may seem like small things to make no difference but those are the ways which I can resist it and if you want to say outside of these things we're told in America that there's like these two political parties and in these two political parties, I got to accept these five issues or these five issues. And once I choose the party, I got to ignore the sin to the other one. And what I can do is I can choose to not allow anyone to set the agenda to things I'm going to care about. I can be intentional about like the one of the amazing things about injustice in America, in the United States is how much so much of our fight is rooted in privilege. In other words, I have the money to afford like organic this and recycle that, but most people who can't, there are food deserts all over the United States where you can't get access to these things. So I'm actually in a place where I can use my economic um, um, reality to begin to point towards a different world and I can advocate. Here's a very simple thing, at least in like I live 45 minutes outside of Chicago. There are five grocery stores um, near where I am where I can get any food that I want at any moment. Maybe this is just American in United States gluttony. But if you go down into the city um, in urban areas, there are like whole chunks of neighborhoods where they're not grocery stores and being a part of lobbying to get a grocery store put in that community is one way we can resist the ways in which society steps on and allows us to ignore other people so there are there are as many rebellions as there are people the hard part is not knowing what to do it's to beginning to do something instead of just accepting this is the world as it is and because i can't do everything I should do nothing. And I just want to say that is a lie. I mean, we 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 have agency. And I'm sure that if you look through, I will say this, 
a friend of mine who works here. Um, she works in like the church ministry department down on the next floor below. She's running for a school board. So she's going to be a Christian who's like, you know, like this local little election that helps figure out how like elementary schools and middle schools are run. You ain't no money. We probably get, you know, no money to do it. But she cares enough to engage in this small local thing that actually has impact on the lives of students. I'm sorry, Allison, you've got me worked up about this. I'm going to say one more thing and then I'll give you an example. My mother, my mother got a brain tumor when I was in seventh grade. And because of the medicine that she had, she was unable to work. So we went on government assistance. What did my mom do as a result of that? She started volunteering at my school every single day. And she became the president of basically the, the, the student association at that school. She eventually became the first black woman to be elected to the school board locally where we are and the first black woman to be the head of the basically all of the student associations related to schools in the whole state of Alabama. So this is a woman who was disabled, who was on government assistance, who said, I see a problem with how children are being educated. And she got involved, started with my school, went from my school to my city, went from my city to the whole state. So this idea that like there's no way for us to resist the empire because it is all persuasive. And I know that's not the way that the question imposed it, but it's the way that it's certain received. I'm saying look around, give up with some of your time and get to work. I have no idea what's going on in um, Canada, but I'm assuming that if you go somewhere, there are very few places that you know what we have way too many volunteers. So find something that you care about and get about the work. of, And it, it doesn't have to be like all Jesus all the time. It can just be good work. Work is good. So that's what I would that's how I would answer the question, Allison. With my mom as an example. Agreed. Nice. <laughs> Sweet. All right. So turning it then to a little bit more of the interpersonal. Um, yes. I mean, yes, clearly we are from different political contexts, but there is definitely, I, I mean, Canada is, is certainly, as, as a questioner has put it, not immune uh, to political tribalism. Um, we got our own issues, some of which are similar to those uh, south of the border, some of which are different. Um, but, you know, that same kind of uh, divisive questions, divisive issues, how we respond to them, what's uh, true and and all this I mean, all this kind of uh, stuff. So um, the questioner is wondering if uh, you have any words of wisdom or advice for speaking with friends or family um, about uh, specifically maybe about our Christian political witness when we have these stark kind of political disagreements with one another. Yeah, um, one of the things that happens is if, if it's generational. One is to understand like the options that are on the table. What I mean is sometimes I can look back at a previous generation and said, given these three options, I can see why you opted for this one. But given where we are now, we're in a different world. And so the first thing that you want to say is that assuming there's some goodwill, there, there needs to be some empathy. And the second thing that I want to do is like, usually before you can get into a policy issue, you have to get to like these fundamental principles. And there's certain things that are fundamentally true that Christians have just decided isn't true. So like, you might even say something like, does the Bible think we should care about poor people? Then they might wanna run and yell about, well, what about this policy? What about the self? No, 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 just walk them through. Okay, let's, let's not talk about any policies. What I try to get people to understand is postures. And so like, what kind of, posture does the Bible presume that we ought to have to certain situations before we get to the details of a particular policy. So what I mean by that is, and, and I use this, I use this, this one word that's really helpful. There's this word in the Old Testament called the oppressed. It's translated as oppressed. And I, I like to ask people like, what does the word oppressed mean in the Bible? And you can do this by just looking around at how it's used. And usually oppressed refers to someone who's treated unfairly by society, like either by some law or some, some mistreatment. And God often says, because the oppressed experience these things, I'll rise up and fight for them. And so before you get to any policy, I say, well, hold on. 
the Bible has a category of someone who's untreated, who's treated unfairly by society. Do we think that that category of people no longer exists? In the Old Testament, there's a group of people who are treated unfairly by society, but now in, the, in our Canadian context, there's no one who's treated unfairly by society. That seems to be strange. The Bible doesn't speak about the category of the oppressed going away. So I say, okay, you have a category of people called the oppressed. The Bible speaks about the oppressed receiving justice. We could disagree about the best way for them to receive it, but the idea that a Christian would contend for these things. So what I want to say is that most people think that the only thing the Bible has to say is about, you know, the plan of salvation. But that's just patently not true. One of the things, and so like, it's much more, if you're going to make progress when talking about, talking with family members and friends, is not starting with the place of policy and arguing about a present issue. Let's get at what the Bible says. One of the things that happens in the United States is there's this constant idea is that we should just preach the gospel or just focus on the gospel. Does this happen in Canada ever? Or is this just an American phenomenon? Okay, so I can talk about this for a second. So what I say to people is that's a very strange thing to do because on one level, like the Bible doesn't just preach the gospel. And what I mean by that is like Paul talks about how you become a Christian, but Paul also talks about how you should parent. Paul also talks about how you should treat your spouse. Paul also talks about what you should, you should do in worship. So it is not true that the Bible itself only recounts over and over how to become a Christian. The Bible talks about all kinds of things. Even Jesus doesn't just preach the gospel all the time. He heals people. And so this, so this idea that like only preaching the gospel literally means you have to cut out most of the New Testament. Now, that means that frees us from having it. And what, what Christians tend to do, Jesse, rest of the group, is that in order to get Christians to care about it, they just start, let's keep adding stuff to the gospel. So if I can get it into the definition of gospel, then Christians must care about it. But I just got to say, well, hold on. If it's in the New Testament, we have to care about it. I don't have to say just preach the gospel and not make peace because Jesus told me to make peace. And so what people have to actually prove is where is it in the New Testament it says that only a subsection of what the New Testament depicts is the Christian vocation, not to mention literally the whole Old Testament. And so if you're going to preach the Bible, yes, you should articulate the gospel all of the time. Jesus loves us. And we won't even get into the definition of what the gospel is. We'll just say Jesus loves us and he died for our sins. We'll call that the gospel. That's fine. You can say that every day if you want to. But that doesn't mean that that's all the Christians say. And nobody actually believes this. What I say to people all of the time is if all Christians should do is preach the gospel, I want you to counsel every parenting, every financial conference, every missions con, all of these things that are ancillary, that just help people live, that aren't the gospel. So we actually do as a church, most churches do tons of things beyond preaching the gospel because they recognize that as a manifestation of Christian discipleship. So I know I need to, I'm running out of five minutes left in the meeting. Are they, they going to kick me off, Jesse? I don't think it'll kick you off. No, it's just all giving us the heads up. Okay. So anyways, what I try to say, what I try to help people do is what I'm trying to say is before I jump into policy, I help people understand they literally have an understanding of Christianity that isn't rooted in biblical text. It's rooted in a certain way that Christianity has begun to be practiced that is kind of separatist and pietistic. It's, this may seem like par for the course from Mennonites because you guys were doing this forever, but it's not been like what the rest of the Christian church has been doing. That's really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, so with the five minutes left, I want to maybe switch us to a little bit of a bigger picture thing, right? Because a lot of what you've been talking about is only like this subset of what you're trying to articulate in your book, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's part of the exercise. So this, what you began your conclusion with, I want to, I want to bring a question out of this as maybe a way for us to wrap up. Okay, so you write, believe it or not, you write, uh, this book began with a claim, namely that the black ecclesial tradition of which I am one of many heirs has a distinctive message of hope arising from its reading of biblical texts. This message of hope is not simply a thing of the past. It is living and active, having the ability to provide a way forward for black believers who continue to turn to the scriptures for guidance. So the question I want to ask is many of your audience right now 
is not like you a part of the black ecclesial tradition. Yeah. And so I would love for you to, I mean, maybe this isn't fair of me to ask you to do this in the five minutes we have left, <laughs> but if what is that, that distinctive message of hope that the black ecclesial tradition is able to articulate that the rest of us need to hear? Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll do two things, Jesse, because I only listen to half, only do half of what you tell me to do. I know for some people, hearing about the Black Ecclesiastical tradition may be may be weird, but like I would say that, and just to give it an, a kind of an orientation, I think that the Mennonite tradition doesn't just exist for Mennonites. At their best, they offer a certain way of being to the world. And so, like I think that you know, there are very few churches that are tr Christian tradition that I just go that whole thing is wrong. You should just push it to the side. And so I think that the church at its best is offering its gifts to the wider body of Christ. So when I talk about the black ecclesial tradition, I'm talking about what we give to the world. So what is one of the distinctive things that we give to the world, at least in the United States? We have the advantage of what I like to say in the United States and never believe in the propaganda. In other words, we, we are born into a church that was already fundamentally corrupt that was enslaving persons. And so we had to make sense of how do I be a Christian in a world where I see the church compromised in a profound way. So we've, we, we, we kind of, we were born with the Odyssey. And so we are now trying to figure out a lot of people, especially young people are growing up and they're seeing the church fail in a thousand ways. And they go, well, can I be a Christian who values the scriptures and contends for justice when I see the sins of the church and I'm so tempted to give up I say, well, hold on. We were born literally saying to the most majority of Christians, stop enslaving us. So the first thing that we do is that we 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 don't have a rosy, like the black people don't go to college and read about church history and go, oh, the church was really messed up. We knew about it from the beginning, it's in our bones. The second thing that 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 I would say is that it knows. How do I say this well? Black Christians then know how to function without power. In other words, we don't have a Christendom background. We never had the votes. We never had the money. We never had the economic. We never had, we could never bend society to our will. We were always the minority. And so, especially in a place like Canada, I'm assuming, I don't know a lot about the religious life in Canada, but there's not enough Christians to kind of enforce their view on society. So how do you be an advocate without social power? Well, we have simply been having to rely upon the power of God and the means of Jesus, nonviolent protest. And so we have two things then. How are you Christian? How can you maintain Christian faith while recognizing the profound failures of the church? And one of the other gifts that we can give is how do you how do you function as a Christian without power? And if there's a reason why this book is resonating with so many people, it's that everybody in the West is now figuring out that you have to be a Christian without power. And sometimes it is actually when you don't have power that you can actually most closely approximate the way of Jesus. Most of the times when the church has profoundly embarrassed itself is that when we had a lot of power and we said we're going to use that to enforce some Christian vision upon the world and the ending in disaster. I finished at seven o'clock. That was good. <laughs> Brilliant. Wow, look at us go. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we are at the end of our time, uh, but just wanted to say thank you, Esau, for speaking to us and, yeah, for presenting so well, especially with all the time restraints that were put on us last minute. So, yeah, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and I just, I wish the discussion could keep going, so I'm sad that this won't continue. But um, thank you everyone for your questions and your contributions. This is the last forum of the year. Um, yeah, so maybe next year we'll continue doing it in this format, who knows? But thank you for your engagement, uh, it's great. So thank have a great night, everybody. <laughs>